Right, so now I've hit record. <laughs> Welcome again, everybody. I'm glad I remembered instead of getting half an hour into my lecture and realizing I wasn't recording. Although I guess it's archived to Twitch briefly, so maybe I do have a backup. Anyway, the first thing we're going to cover, two new classes, synth and synth def. These are um, a pair of really important classes that pop up all the time once we sort of get into mid-level synthesis. And we're going to talk about what they are, what they do, and how they compare to the function.play construction that we've been uh, using otherwise. Um, so we'll get into that. That's the first thing. Uh, we are also going to talk about iteration. Uh, iteration on, in the language, iteration on the audio server. Iteration is a process that repeats, and it allows you to do a lot of things very elegantly with not very much code, and it can be applied to synthesis processes as well. So we'll see some of the ways we can do that. And then also we'll talk briefly, or maybe sort of not quite briefly, we'll see. Um, conditional logic, things like if, then, else, case, for, while, basically uh, some you know logical branching so you can execute some code and then midway you make a check is it this or is it that and if it's this do this if it's that do that and then if we have time at the end we will maybe get into some uh fun new unit generators like maybe some filters i want to talk a little bit also about triggers and how triggers work with envelopes and trigger arguments and maybe some uh, spatial unit generators so panning um, we will see. We'll see how far we get. But these three things are what I want to cover. So uh, without further ado, let's talk about synth and synth def. And to start, what I'm going to do is first create a function that makes sound and send it the play message. This is something that we know by now. We've spent several weeks doing this. Um, so let's see. We'll make a, a signal. We'll make an envelope. We'll give it an argument, frequency, and amplitude. So we have an envelope. We'll do env.new. We will make it go from 0 to 1 to 0, quickly up to 1, and then it'll take a second to get back down. This will be a slightly curved attack and a more steeply curved decay. Looks like this. So it's going to be a little percussive ping. And we'll say, oh, we need a comma, of course, here. Done action two. Sig. Wonderful sine oscillator. Freak. Initial phase of zero. We'll use our amp argument for our mull value, which is by default 0.5. So we're going to be not at full amplitude by default. Apply our amplitude envelope. And finally, return. Uh, this monophonic sine osc exclaim 2, which gives us a copy in the right channel as well as the left channel. And what I'm going to do is call this uh, tone. And we have to boot the server. So the server is booted. So there we go. We've defined our function. And then we can say x equals tone dot play oh all right it worked so we know we can do things like uh providing args uh, args colon and then an array freak x brand 200 to 2000 okay with me so far this is all stuff we know uh and if we make this, um, actually, you know what? Uh, I just want to I want to go over the set command and the free command. So I'm gonna uh, actually change this to an env type called ASR. It's an ADSR but without the D. So we just have an attack, a sustain level, and a release. And this can sustain indefinitely. The arguments are a little bit different. We have an attack time. We'll just keep it at 0.01. That's fine. Sustain level one, release time one. You know what? We can just go with the, uh, I'm totally fine with just using the defaults. And this needs 
a gate. Gate is the second argument of nfgen. And when gate is zero or negative, the you know if, if the synth starts, if the gate is zero, which I guess we will, the envelope won't start yet. And then when we set gate to a positive value, this is a trigger for the sustaining envelope to begin. And as long as gate remains positive, env.asr and the enclosing envgen will sustain at its sustain level. And then when we set gate back to zero or some negative value, uh, It'll go. It'll it'll start the release phase. So now, if we play this, that didn't work. Oh yeah, that's right. Of course, it didn't work. Uh, it's because gate is initially zero. So now we can say x dot set gate one. So it's sort of a delayed onset here. Whenever we feel like it, there's our sound, and we can set gate back to zero, and it stops. And then we have done action two, free the synth, so we are not able to re-trigger it, we have to actually uh, create a new one. Um, so if we say, we can play it again, set the gate to one, and maybe set the amplitude to 0.2, make it a little quieter. And then, Okay, so this is stuff we, uh, we've seen before. Uh, we can uh, start a sound. We can set its arguments. We can set its gate, for example, in this case, to 1 or 0. We can set its frequency to some new random value or some specific value, whatever we want. Forgot a parenthesis there. And, of course, we can also uh, use the free message to free a synth prematurely, or just maybe not prematurely, just we can say, go away. I don't care about your envelope anymore. I don't care about your done action two. I'm getting rid of you myself. So we have play, set, etc., etc. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about now are two classes called synth and synth def. Synth and synth def, okay, well, synth def is a class which provides a recipe for some synthesis. It's a lot like what we're doing here. Uh, so we're actually going to translate this to a synth def. Right now it's just a plain old vanilla function with ugens inside of it. But what we're going to do is convert that into a synth def. I'm going to try to keep it on the same uh, part of the screen here so I'm not scrolling back and forth. Okay. What is a synth def? Let's, maybe let's look up the help file. Synthdef is the client-side representation of a synth definition. Okay, we don't really know what that means yet. But there's something, I've, I've pointed this out in my tutorial video 3 as well. Um, uh, synthdef. Uh, okay, here it is. Um, methods such as function play, which is what we've done here and here in sort of two parts, create a function and play it, are simply conveniences which automatically create a synth def. So when we do this and then play it, this line in particular right here, you can actually see in the post window we have an object called a synth. So this actually returns a synth, and what it does behind the scenes is it creates a synth def for us, sort of a temporary synth def with, you know, this name temp 38, 39, whatever. So it's basically cleaning up our mess. We're being really sloppy with function.play. So let's get into synthdef. We're going to do synthdef.new. And for the most part, it's going to be very, very similar to our function here. The, there's three differences, three important things that you have to add as you convert a ugen function like this to a synthdef. The first thing is a name. And we will call this... Uh, pure tone. Capital T. Our capitals matter here. So I'm doing a T because that's sort of a capitalization convention that we see in Super Collider all the time. All right, so it's the, the first argument of synthdef.new is a name. And I provide a symbol. Symbols are delineated with this uh, backslash and then pure tone. 
and then a ugen graph function. And that is this thing right here. It's a function which contains unit generators, which when receiving the play message creates sound on the server. So for the most part, we can simply copy and paste this right here. Right, so we've copied and pasted this function. And so the first thing we need is this name. The second thing we need is to m very explicitly tell the synthf what is your output signal. It's not sufficient to just provide, to just assume it's going to output the last line. Um, we actually have to use a unit generator called out.ar. So out.ar is a unit generator, which has the special side effect of actually writing a signal to a bus. This might be a hardware bus, which is on your sound card or audio interface, which corresponds to one of your output channels. It might be an internal bus somewhere for passing signal from a generating process to an effect process, like reverb or delay or something. But we need to explicitly specify this. And we provide for out.ar a bus and an argument called channels array. And I don't, this is just a fancy word for the signal that you want to output. So buses, the easiest thing to do right now is to just hard code the number zero into this. Um, so basically when we talk about output buses, they are numbered with integers. And the lowest numbered hardware bus, the lowest numbered buses correspond to your hardware outputs. Those are the ones that you will actually hear if your audio hardware is connected to speakers. And so zero, by default, if you just open up SuperCollider and don't mess with the server configuration, zero is the lowest channel, so that's the left speaker, and uh, one is the right speaker. And if you had an eight channel interface, then outputs zero through seven would correspond to those various um, outputs in order. So that's the first thing we need. And then we need the signal that we want to output, and this is simply SIG. Let's just change our indentation there. Okay, so this is the first thing we need to add inside of synth.new as a name. We provide the function and explicitly tell it at the very end what signal to output. And then we close the synthdef, and by synthdef.new we've created a new instance of synthdef, but that, then, then we need to tell that synthdef dot add. Add yourself to the synthdef library on the server. There are other methods you can use here, but add is the most flexible. I think it's the, most, it's the one that I use all the time. And uh, right, so let's evaluate this. This is what we want to see. We have created an instance of synthdef called pure tone. This is like defining an instrument. It's the same thing that we've done up here, except we've been a little bit more formal about it. So that's this step. Now, how do we actually play this, right? We can't say, we can't just put a dot play at the end of this. Actually, we can, but that's one way to do it. But the way, the, the sort of most proper middle of the road way to do it is to create uh, not a function dot play here, but to simply create a new synth. So th these are partner classes, basically. They work together. Synthdef provides instructions, and synth is the execution. That's sort of the green light. It says, okay, let's make some sound. So synth.new needs at least two things. Well, actually, just one thing. It needs the name of the synthdef that it's going to use. And that didn't work. All oh, right, it's because my gate is zero. Okay, so that's fine. Uh, if we look at the node tree, we can see that uh, we actually do have a synth called pure tone. It's finally not called like temp whatever, temp 39 underscore underscore blah, 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 blah. Right, so there it is, it's sitting there. And the gate is initially zero, which means the envelope hasn't started yet. It's waiting to begin its attack phase. It's just hovering at zero. And, uh, so what we can do is x dot set uh, gate one. Uh, let's see. 
We can set the amplitude. And we can tell the envelope to stop, and that triggers done action too. And that is synth and synth def. Um, okay, so do we need the backslash in the name? Yes, you do. If you do something like this, it's going to say variable not declared or not defined, right? It thinks this is a variable and it there's no declaration statement somewhere. So it's got to be a symbol. It can also be a string. That's fine. And then I think if we, I, I don't know if we need to, yeah, so that works too. I usually just, I mean, I, it's rather than mix and match, I try to just pick one and commit with it, or commit to it rather. So you need that symbolic name, backslash, and then some word. Uh, okay, so are you with me? Did I lose anybody? Um, so there, there are these two strategies for making sound, basically. The, the quickest and easiest way is to make a function, just drop some unit generators in there and just say, dot play, go. I don't, I don't care about anything else, just make sound. And then there's this way down here, which is you make a synth def, you give it a name, you specify its output very clearly, and you add it, and then you can create that sound by making new instances of the synth class. Um, a few more, a few more syntactical things. So we can just make the sound with the default arguments. When we do this, uh, let's. Um, I'm sick of running gate dot one. I'm going to change the default in the synth def to from zero to one. So now when we run this, we're again using the default values. And the default, I've overwritten the synth def. The default for gate is now one. So the sound starts immediately. Right. Uh, so the way I like to think about it is that function.play is like going to McDonald's. It's like you're hungry, you don't have time, you don't care. Just give me a big giant burger to schlomp down on, you know. And, you know, you don't know what they're doing back there in the kitchen. All you know is what comes out. It's delicious. It sounds great. It tastes great. That's what I needed, right? I, you know, but then synthdef is like... A home cooked meal. It's like you have time. You're going to specify exactly what you want. You're going through the process. You know exactly what goes into your food. You can customize it however you want. Uh, and then, you know, you can sit down and enjoy your meal. This is not the greatest analogy in the world, but uh, it's, um, it's one way of thinking about it. Uh, so it's, uh, and I think that's, that's actually mentioned in the function help file, if we go look at the play message. So, uh, yeah, it, it says here, uh, this is probably the simplest way to get audio in uh, SC3. It wraps the function in a synth def, adding an out eugen if needed, creates and starts a new synth with it, and returns the synth object. A lin n, which is a type of envelope, it's also added to avoid clicks, uh, which is configured to allow the resulting synth to have its gate argument set. So basically what happens here is when we make a function and say dot play, uh, what happens is the, um, the, the, this function behind the scenes, SuperCollider takes this function and plugs it into a synth def, uh, assigns a temporary name, it takes the last line and plugs it into an out eugen, and it then adds and plays that synth def and returns this synth. So uh, it's, there's a whole lot of stuff happening in the background uh, that's taken care of. So it's, it's very convenient to be able to, I don't wanna make a synth def, just play this function. Uh, but um, when you're actually sitting down and writing a piece and, and uh, you know, um, you wanna do it right, you know, this is the way to do it. Uh, if we wanna start the synth, with uh, different arguments. All right, so here we're just starting with the defaults. Um, I guess sometimes, it depends. Um, 
you honestly could you could get away with using either one uh but in uh for example if you just want to play a very simple sound straight to your hardware outputs in the middle of a piece like program some midi controller button or something to just play a sine wave or play a burst of noise or something you could just write the small function right there it's just really quick and there you go and maybe you don't feel like going through the whole process of making a synth def not that it's that much longer. But the real advantage to SynthDef is that you can specify where the signal goes. And this, this is this, the ability to say, here are your outputs. And you can also you know, specify multiple outputs. Like for example, we've, that, this one has just been monophonic, right? This, we're not doing any exclamation point two here. And so if we do this and then play it, comes out of both. Uh, both of those uh, output channels, um, and and we could also do we can also do you know multi-channel expansion here on the output UGen. So this creates two an array of two outs, one going to zero and one going to one. So that works as well. So basically, you can think of synth defs as like individual modules in your analog studio full of hardware. So you know you can. You have your mixer, and you have your reverb effect rack, and your, you have your delay effect rack. And then these outputs, these are like, this is like your patch bay. And you say, OK, I want you know, this signal to go here, and this signal to go there. And sometimes it's, you know, it's better to not hardwire these. Because right now, we've hardwired the synth to go directly to the speakers. And maybe sometimes we want to send it to a reverb effect, and then send the reverb effect to the uh, output. So we can declare another argument here, and we'll default that to zero. And to specify arguments for a synth, we provide the name, and then the second item that we provide for synth.new is an array of arguments. And this is exactly the same as this. You know, we could even put args colon, because that is the name of this argument here. And so we can say out zero freak, uh, you know, 800, and close the array. And so now this will play to uh, output bus zero. That's the left speaker. And it plays 800. If I change this to 400 and one, output bus one, it's an octave lower, and it's in the other speaker. Um, so I, and uh, it's it's all about maximum reuse and flexibility. You know, it's uh, it's I think it's mostly these these out dot ars. So some of the questions you'll get over the course of the week is convert the following function into a synth def, right? So we we just have some ugen function, and we're going to say instead turn it into a synth def. Maybe add some arguments, and then use synth to instantiate various types of these synths. That's true. Yes, thank you, Alan, for pointing that out. Uh, there is a method. It's not add. It's something else. Uh, I think it's load. And load for synthdef. Uh, I don't know if this is it, but basically what Alan is saying is that when you're in Super Collider and you use a, I think it, maybe it's write def. Write def file maybe yeah and so basically what this does is not, not only does it load this synth def onto the server but it writes the um you know it writes the synth def to a file on your computer such that when you open up super collider again and launch and boot the server all of the synth defs in that directory automatically get added so they're ready and available for you to use them rather than you having to evaluate your 10 or 20 or 30 synth defs again. So that, that is another advantage. I forgot about that one. Um, nevertheless, I do just commonly do add, and I have a clump of code at the top of my file usually, which is just all my synth defs, and we just evaluate them all together. And that's really all there is to it. Um, yeah, so there's, there's more to, to synth def. You know, eventually, a couple of weeks from now, we'll get to creating sound a synth def that generates signal, 
and synth depths that process signal. Like maybe we'll make something which produces a, saw a rich spectrum sawtooth wave, and then we will use out and our understanding of server architecture to play that through a filter or play that through a delay, and we'll start building more complicated synthesis functions. All right, so just to recap, you have a function with uGens, turn it into a synthdef, you give it a name, synthdef.new, name it, comma, uGen function, make sure to explicitly specify the output, close the synthdef, and do dot add. All right. Okay. Let's move on. If anyone's got any additional questions, uh, fire away. Okay, so let's talk about iteration. Iteration is the ability to create a process and have it repeat for a certain number of times or uh, until some condition is met. And it's a, it's a, characteristic that you find in all all programming languages. They all have some, some way to iterate over things. There are two methods that I'm going to introduce because these are the methods for iteration that I use most frequently. There are several, but they are um, these two that I want to talk about are do and collect. So these are defined for a class called collection. If we do a find for collect, <laughs> we have to go through all these instances of collection. Maybe we'll do a find for iteration instead. Yeah. So this is a section of the collection help file. A collection is is a is a superclass of many many different types of classes of collections like array, list, dictionary, all these things. They're all types of collections, and because methods like do and collect are defined for collection, they're defined for all the subclasses as well. So let's look at do first. Uh, do uh, is given a single argument, which is a function, so something in curly braces, and do will evaluate its function for each item in the collection, optionally passing the item from the collection into the function on each evaluation. Okay, so do is defined for collection. So first, let's, so let's we'll make a collection, and we're going to use array because that's that's what we've been using. So let's just make uh, numbers between ten, uh, integers between ten and fifty. Exclaim eight. We'll say uh, a equals this array. And there it is. Okay, so we've created an array, A, and it happens to be these eight numbers. Now there are many situations where you have a collection of things and you want to modify that collection or create a new collection of things based on this original collection. And the easiest way to do that is to use iteration. So, um, would somebody give me an example of something we might want to do to these numbers? Or something we might want to generate using these numbers? Anything at all that, that comes to mind. And we'll try to do it with do. Very simply named method, just do. Do the following function for each item in this collection. Panning. Okay. Uh, that is... A little advanced, but that's a good idea. Um, we want to use these numbers to somehow. Yeah, let's start there. Let's start with mapping them to another region. Um, uh, we know that I think we can do. Can't see on the chat screen. Oh, uh, oh, there's nothing on. Let me uh, give me a second. Can't see chat on screen. I think something weird happened. Copy this and edit this. Let's see, Let's see if we test it now. You can see me in chat. I mean, I I see I see that on chat. Yeah, sorry about that. 
Okay. Yeah, uh, that was weird. I, I fixed it for the uh, stream starting soon screen, but then I guess... Not really sure. Okay, but it's working now, so that's good. Um, okay, so let's map these to another uh, uh, region using iteration. Now, we, we already know that we can... I think we can use... Uh, lin x or something on on an array. Let's see. Let's go from ten to fifty to a thousand to two thousand. Okay, this technically works. So in this particular case, we don't necessarily need iteration, but let's do it. Let's do it anyway. Um, so a is a collection. We're going to use a dot do, and then in parentheses provide a function. Right, and to show you that the, maybe maybe the simplest thing you can do, you just post hi. Let's say hi, and watch what happens in the post window here. We do the following function, and by do we mean evaluate the following function for each item in A. And there are eight items in the array called A, and so we see hi posted eight times. Now, if we want to uh, post the item in the array itself, well, how do we, you know, there's a lot of cases where it's very useful to, uh, to want to access the items in the array inside of this iterative function. The way we do that is we just declare an argument. And the name of the argument does not matter. Uh, in a lot of cases, I just do a single character here. But if you want to say, you know, item or num for number, uh, that's fine too. It really doesn't matter. So we will just say num dot post ln. Okay, and now we will evaluate this. And as we iterate over the collection, we post each item. And uh, you know we could do something else, like post one more than each item. And what it does is it passes each item, the first item being 22, passes it in, adds one, and posts it. And then it repeats that for the other seven items. So, uh, what was it? Map it to another range. So we just simply say num uh, dot linux from 10 to 50 onto 1,000 to 2,000 dot post ln. And there we go. So that's uh, that's do. Um, what you will notice is that after evaluating the function for each item in the collection, do returns its receiver, and it does not modify its receiver. It leaves its receiver alone. So if we check a, it is still the same function. And even if we were to say a equals a dot do, in this case. So, you know, we've, we've got this function in here, which is posting numbers mapped onto a new range. Uh, even if we check A, it is still the original array. So do does not modify or mutate its receiver in any way. Um, and that is primarily where do and collect differ. Do returns its receiver, unchanged, unharms. Collect returns a new collection, a new modified collection based on what its function returns. So let's go ahead and change do to collect. Now if we take away this a equals, uh, we're going to collect over the array a, which is still, as, as we uh, left it, randomly generated, and we're going to map each number and then we're going to post it. And so as we do this, we'll see that what we return is actually a modified collection. It returns a new array, and it plugs the result of each function evaluation into the corresponding index of the receiver array. And so A is still unchanged, but this expression that we just evaluated returns a different array. It returns a modified array. So if we were here to say uh, a equals a dot collect, now we have actually modified a. Now a is something different. 
And so if we were to run this again, we'd get, I think, really gargantuan numbers. Uh, yeah, we would just clip out at uh, 2,000 because now all these numbers are in the between 1,000 and 2,000. And if it's trying to map tiny numbers onto giant numbers, uh, they're all way out of this range, so they get clipped to the highest value. So um, that is all just to say that collect modifies its receiver, and we can then set it equal to something in order to store the result of this iterative process. That's an introduction to do and collect. We can do a lot more things with them, which we're going to do, but I just want to make sure. So far, is that is that making sense to everyone? So map those. Map those, but return, and in this case, store a new collection. Cool. So uh, let's see. Yeah, OK, so the difference is in uh, what they return. And every, every method returns something. Do returns its receiver. Uh, things in the function get evaluated and might have side effects. You know, the, the function might create some synths or, or create some windows or change the color of something, but the receiver remains unchanged. The receiver is basically, in the case of do, the, um, the receiver is basically a way to get the function to be evaluated a certain number of times. So sometimes you'll just plug in any old array, like, you know, the array 0 through 9 integers, and that way you're saying do this function 10 times. And what, what's important in that case is what's in the function. Because do is not going to return anything particularly useful. It just returns its receiver. And we already had the receiver to begin with. So it's what's in the function that matters. But collect actually returns a modified collection based on what's in the function. So um, that, that's the difference. And let's, let's uh, just grab our our synth def. I mean, we, we don't need to reevaluate it, but I do want to paste it into this code. So we have it. And we'll start uh, doing some iteration with uh, sound. OK, so we've got this, this function. And it's a, yeah, it's a sustaining sine wave. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a collect and do are valid, will, will behave uh, uh, homogeneously on any subclass of collection. So that includes, yeah, here's, here's a hierarchy in a, in a folder, in a file called collections. We have collection, which is the superclass of all of these things, array 2D, bag, identity bag, interval, all these wacky things that I have never used, most of them. We have array, there's our good friend array, uh, and all sorts of other things. All of these subclasses understand, do, and collect, and anything else defined in this uh, file here. So, you know, all these things. Size is empty, returns true or false, whether it's empty. Add, add all, all of these things. And this includes do and collect. So they work for array, but they work for lots of other things as well. There is... Um, there's one thing I want to one more thing I want to add about synth and synth def before we uh, move on. But uh, so this this version here is monophonic, right? And there are a couple of ways that we can uh, yeah no problem. There are a couple of ways that we can make the stereo. Uh, one we can just uh, you know we can well okay. Uh, the point I want to make here is that uh, earlier we did something like this, right? We made two separate outs, one for the left, one for the right, and it becomes becomes stereo. And alternatively, we can do 0, 1 for the out, and that works as well. So, but here's, here's a question. Now, let's say we make this, um, you know, just out, we'll default it to 0. So it's just zero, and then we do exclamation point two on this function. So this becomes a stereo signal, and multiplied by an envelope, still a stereo signal. And then we're trying to write a stereo signal to a single hardware bus. What is going to happen? Are we going to get an error? Uh, are we only going to get one channel? Let's find out. 
and we get a stereo signal. So this works too. The, the behavior here is if out has a, an integer for its output bus and receives an array of signals, it will put the zeroth item from the array at this bus. It will put the next item at this bus plus one, and then this one, you know, the next one at plus two, next one plus three. So it just takes the lowest, the the first, the, the very the zeroth item index and puts it at the bus specified here, and the remaining channels just get assigned to uh, increasing channels that are adjacent. So in this case, we have a signal which has two identical sine waves. The first one goes to output zero, and then the next bus is one. So the other part, the other component in that array goes to uh, the next one. I don't think you can actually. That's, let's, let's find out what happens here. Maybe it'll work? I don't think so. This is something that, no, does not work. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, it's the, the the key here is that out is a special unit generator. It's uh it's it's really uh inside, yes. That will work. That will definitely work. Because we are making sig stereo and that's what we are outputting. Uh so so yeah, you cannot exclam duplicate an out unit generator because they're not normal unit generators, they're special unit generators which have this primary side effect of writing a signal to a bus, right? And uh, so we need to use out for that, and we need to make sure that the signal we provide is already the correct array size that we want. We can't do this. And here's here's another thing which um, which uh, which fails. Let's say we have a stereo signal, and then we provide the array zero comma one. Now this looks like it's going to work. Uh, it looks like it's going to work because we have a stereo signal. All right, so this is actually an array, and we want to put it on bus zero and one, right? But so let's play this, and you'll notice something strange. Something strange in the in the in the meters. You'll see that channel one is louder, or it seems to be louder and sounds louder than the left channel. Let's see that again. Right. So that's that's not correct. It sounds okay, and, and if you're not paying attention and you don't have the meters open, you'll think, oh, okay, that works. Next problem. So what I'm going to do is very quickly uh, s.options.num output bus channels and set this equal to 4 and reboot the server. And we're going to... Uh, oh, document drag error. Okay, I'm going to ignore that. Um... Okay, so I've I've rebooted the server. I don't know what that was about. And now we have four hardware outputs. We don't really have four, four hardware output buses, but we're telling Super Collider, just so you know, we've got, don't you worry about it. We've got four. And uh, so now if we were to write something to two or three, we'd see it here. So, but this this little trick allows us to see what's actually going on here. So I'm going to play this this bogus synth again. And so now you might be able to guess what's going on here. Um, what's happening is we have a, have a stereo signal with two identical sine waves, and we are outputting it to bus 0 and 1. So the first thing out does is it outputs that stereo signal to bus 0, and then, of course, the right channel gets assigned to the next available bus, 0 and 1. Then it outputs the stereo signal to bus 1. So it puts the left channel here, and then it says, OK, I got a stereo signal, so I'm going to put the right channel here. So bus 1 gets two copies. It gets the right channel and then the left channel, and they get summed together. And that's why we have this weird pyramid shape. So this is wrong. This is, uh, it, it looks like it's going to work, but again, out.ar, out this is a special type of unit generator, which is for writing a signal to a bus. And so rather than focus on all these bogus ways things where, where things go wrong, the thing to do is just either put a zero here, or if you want, declare an argument and set it equal to zero, and then you can put whatever signals you want here, and you know a, st a stereo signal, for example, will start at zero and be to zero and one. If you have, you know, an eight-channel interface, you can set this to eight, reboot the server, and duplicate this eight times and output it to bus zero, and that gives you what you want. So I would avoid putting arrays here 
and don't try to duplicate this like that. So uh, just just a simple stereo signal being written to a single bus and super collider takes care of the rest. I hope that's clear. Yeah, so there, now we've got our stereo sound. I know we're probably all getting very, very tired of this sine wave. Not the, not the most interesting sound in the world. So I was going to talk about iteration and synthesis, okay? So uh, let's imagine, uh, let's, let's go and uh, generate another array between uh, 40 and 80. Uh, not play. Look at, look at my instincts are just kicking in. Uh, multiply that by eight, and there we go. Now, what we're going to do is think of these notes. I gave it away. We're going to think of these integers as notes. Specifically, we're going to think of these as as MIDI note numbers. And for anyone who's not familiar, uh, MIDI note numbers it's it's a way of uh, describing the frequency range, you know, logarithmically. The same way we think about a piano keyboard, with number sixty being middle C, and then seventy two. 12 semitones up is the an octave above that, 84, 96. So we're going to use these as MIDI note numbers. And uh, we can do, uh, if we do 60.MIDI CPS, here's a very, very handy method. This returns the corresponding frequency value. That's the frequency of middle C. If we do 72.MIDI CPS, it gives us twice that value, one octave higher. So that's very convenient. So we've got this uh, array, which you've created, A, 74, 73, 71, et cetera. So let's use do to create a synth for each, for each of these. Right? So we're going to say A dot do. And then in parentheses, we provide a function, curly braces, and since we're going to use these as MIDI note numbers, the contents of A, we need to declare an argument. And here's a good opportunity to make a meaningful name. We can say note num or something. Uh, so as we evaluate this function the first time, note num is going to be 74. On the second time, note num is going to be 73. And uh, so all we really have to do is synth.new pure tone and then in uh, a, in an array here provide frequency note num dot midi cps and we could close it there but because we're going to be making eight of these it's probably good to turn down the amplitude a little bit so we need a comma here amp 0 0.05 maybe and then we close the synth and that should be it. Yeah. Yeah, a little hard to tell what's going on here, but um you know, we can just say uh change this to well, um let's let's pull this out for a second. You know, the really stupid way to do this would be to you know, copy and paste all these and uh you know, just to plug these values in individually. I'm going to I'm going to manually do what we just did. So instead of this, we're going to say 74 73 71 40 49 60 52 and 60 again. So that's what do did, but it did it in the blink of an eye. Let's command period on that and right. So here is a, another good opportunity to point out the difference between do and collect. We've done do. We didn't, I mean, and do just returns its receiver. So A is just still A. You know, that's, that's what we saw in the post window. And we didn't give these synths any names. So, uh, you know, it's how do we access them? How do we change their frequency? Like, wh what do we... You know, if I want to change the first one from a MIDI note 74 to MIDI note 76, how, how do I do it? I can't, right? These, I, these synths are inaccessible. They don't have a name or anything. So I'm just going to do um, s.free all and just uh, realize that, you know, 
do is probably not the best option here if we want to return a new collection containing the result of this function, which would be eight synths. And then we have an array of those synths, so that would be really handy. Um, notice that we can't do something like this because, uh, you know, I think, okay, now we're calling it x. Okay, but we're calling what x? We're calling, uh, we're going to do this function the first time x equals a synth. Great. And x is the synth with, with uh, this MIDI note here, 74. Then, you know, it goes to the next item, 73, and it says x equals a synth, and the frequency is different. And so our first value of x gets overwritten. So if we were to do this, the only thing we can do is access the last item. So we'll hear a slight difference here if we free this. Right? But the rest of them are stuck there, so... The, probably the best thing to do here is, is not name it inside the function, but instead use collect and store the result of collect in an array. Or, or you know, give it, give it a global variable name, we'll call it tilde synths. So synths equals a.collect. Now, instead of seeing this in the post window, we are now going to see an array containing eight synths. So watch this. Aha. So now we have this array and this array. And we have a lovely collection of eight instances of this synth diff called pure tone. And so, you know, here's what we can do. Um, we can do uh, synths dot, uh, let's just do do, and we can say arg synth, that's what we're passing in, synth dot free. So we're using iteration again to stop all these sounds, and ready, there they go, they're gone. We have iterated over the returned collection called synths and freed each item. But that's that's not fun, right? We, we want to do something cool to it. So what we can do is iterate over the collection, and instead of freeing them, set each frequency to a new random value. Let's do, actually, let's do uh, our rand. We'll just copy this here. And we're going to make eight new values. All right, our rand 40, 80. Close it out. Oh, you know what I forgot? I forgot MIDI CPS. So these are getting plugged in as is. It's kind of cool. We have some sub bass action going on. So it's actually frequency values between 40 and 80. So we will do dot MIDI CPS and do it again. It's like smooth jazz lounge music. 13, 15, flat 5, sharp 9 chords. You can really snap your fingers to this. Okay. Um, let's uh, synths dot do uh, arg i i dot free. See, I'm using short variables here because sometimes it's just convenient. It's just less stuff to type. Yeah, okay. Uh, and, you know, we don't have to free them either. Let's oh and let's let's uh pop this into our clump of code. So the first thing we do now is we choose a new array. It was starting with the same array each time, but now we're going to pick a new one and uh, collect over that array of numbers and return an array of synths. There we go. We can change the frequency. And when we're done, maybe we do set gate zero. And now instead of freeing them. We take advantage of their gate argument, and they will all nicely fade out. Right. And if we wanted to fade them one at a time, well, uh, we could do it manually. Uh, synth, uh, no, wait, wait, wait. Um, synths at zero dot set gate zero. Remember, this is how we access. Uh, items in the array. So that one's gone. That one's gone. And they're all gone. Uh, could you set a wait period between each iteration over the array? You definitely could. You definitely could. So let's do that. 
I on on my syllabus I have routines and tasks and patterns and scheduling and stuff a little bit down the road. But this is such a natural question that I think I'm gonna do it now. And so I'm gonna introduce a class called routine. Routine is like a function, uh, but you can actually ask it to wait for certain amounts of time during its evaluation. So routine just takes a function, I guess we should say routine.new. So let's say hello dot post ln one dot wait. Or if you prefer wait parentheses one. Alternate syntax. This one is a little bit more readable maybe. Wait one second, right? Put wait one second. Uh, and then good by dot post ln. And then what we do to this new instance of routine is we just say dot play and watch the post window. Hello, one second wait, goodbye. So that is the 10 second introduction to routine. Um, so uh, now look what happens if we uh, if we try to do if we try to just do it in a function, right? We can't just say one dot wait or wait one anywhere. What if we do, you know, function dot value? Right, so here we have a function. It posts a string. It waits one second. It says goodbye. Ready? And it says, whoa, whoa, slow down. Yield was called outside of a routine. Yield is um, it's uh, another uh, wait is. I, I'm not sure why it says yield instead of wait. There's there's certainly a good reason for that. But uh, yield is um, similar to wait. I think yield is if you want to actually return a value instead of just pausing. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't looked this up, but um, that's that's the basics of that. It's just if you want to wait, you need to put it inside of a routine. So uh, this this version here is what we need. Uh, okay, so let's let's incorporate that. Let's. Um, Tell you what, let's let's make we're gonna we're gonna make this uh this sound. There it is. Let's do a different one. That's I like that one. That's good. Okay, so now instead of just setting all their frequencies, we're going to uh, set each of the frequencies individually with one second wait in between. So first things first, routine dot new. This is gonna be. Ooh. And uh, we're going to dot play this. We're gonna play the routine. So inside this do loop, right, so the routine starts, we iterate. And then we pass in the synth, we set its frequency, and then one dot wait. Right? And then we loop back to the beginning of the do. We set the second synth, or the one at index one, we wait. Index two, we wait, and so forth. So uh, let's also post changed dot post ln ready here we go yeah so there's a routine uh, allowing you to perform iteration and including wait times let's wait for only a fifth of a second yeah uh and let's uh, fade these out. So instead of setting, we're going to gate zero. And it's fading them out one by one. All right, so a good exercise here is uh, what if we want to uh, create a cluster of sine waves like we do, and then run a routine that changes them all at the same time every second. Well, let's uh, let's start the sound first of all, and let's figure that out. So we're gonna we're gonna write a routine which is similar, but instead of iterating and changing each one, right, one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, we're gonna change all of them, and then we're gonna wait, and we're gonna change all of them again. So the difference here is is where the um, where the wait time goes. Uh, instead of here, uh, we're going to put it out here, right, and then. We could uh, do this, do this, but then we find ourselves copying. Let's let's start with this here. We're gonna do it. Wait, change all of them again. Wait, 
Oh, I, the gate is set to zero. Oh, <laughs> okay. Let's, uh, uh, instead of changing the frequency, I was, uh, setting the gate to zero. So let's just, uh, copy this and paste it here, paste that here. Let's try that again. Right. And that's the end of that. But whenever you find yourself copying and pasting stuff like this, you should think to yourself, iteration. What am I doing? Why am I not using iteration? So what we can do here is put all of this in a do loop. So maybe we'll just make the array 1 to 10 dot do. Maybe we'll close that out. And let's just let's just take a step back and maybe put some space in here for ourselves to think. Um, all right, so we're playing a routine. And the thing we do in this routine is we iterate over the collection 1 to 10. This is the array 1 through 10. And on each pass, we do a subroutine, a sub, not a subroutine, I shouldn't say routine, a subdo, uh, where we iterate over this array of synths and change each one of their frequencies to a new value. And we don't pause within this. So it, to our ears, it sounds like all eight change instantaneously. And then we wait, and that's the end of the outer do. So we come back for number two, and we do it again and again. And let's change this to 0.2. So we need to start our sound again. I'm going to copy this so I'm not scrolling up all the time. All right, so here we go. And now we're going to hear 10 changes uh, at a fifth of a second each time. Yeah. And let's just quickly synths.do argi i dot set gate zero. Now, um, so we we've we've just shown that we can just this is yeah that was that was a nice beating. Uh, uh, we've shown that do just returns its receiver, so it's very common to just use any old collection containing a known quantity in order to get a function to be uh, evaluated that many times. We don't really care about what do returns. We're not setting it equal to anything. But collect is, you know, returns a modified receiver. So in this case, it's really useful. So we say we're going to collect over these, these eight random numbers and evaluate this function, which returns a synth and store it in the array. So uh, collect returns, you know, this array, but instead of 80, we have a synth whose frequency is equal to MIDI note number 80, and 44, and 60, and 65. And then we can access that collection and use it to do more iteration. Now here, we're not returning a new thing that we care about. We're just evaluating a function that calls a set command on each of those synths and updates it. Um, and uh, so yeah, we've, we've just done the array 1.10.do. Uh, so we can see here, we're just uh, posting the item. And as a shortcut, if you just want to do something 10 times, you don't actually have to make an array with 10 items. As a convenience, you can just type an integer. Now, an integer is not a collection. An integer is just one thing. So you might think, well, how is this working? How, how, is, how, is, how does 10 know how to do? Right? Wouldn't that just do it once because 10 is one thing? Well, do is defined for integers as well, but it's, it's got a, a, a different definition. Uh, basically, it, it uh, treats this number as if it were the, the array of numbers starting at 0, going up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, such that the size is equal to 10. So if we do this, we can actually see in the post window, it passes in the numbers 0 through 9. So here, we don't have to do 1 dot dot 10. We can just do 10. And then... And something else fun you can do is uh, it doesn't have to be a fixed wait time. You can just do a uh, random number between 1 and 0 0.5. 0 0.1 and 
Oh, can you do that? Let's find out. Nah, you cannot. How about that? I thought you could too. Um, what we're doing here, since what kind of class is this? It is an array, right? We can't just say synth.free. Of course you can free a synth, but this is not a synth. It's an array of synths. So unfortunately, the free method is not defined. Well, I guess it is defined for arrays, but it's not doing what we want, right? So this is a perfect example of where iteration I mean, there's no other way, to, no other way to do it, really. We can we can access each item. It just worked on your end. I find that very surprising. Let's see, here we go. Synths dot free. Well, I need to use iteration. Yeah. So this is a way of instead of just passing a message to the collection. We use iteration in order to access each individual item, and then we can do stuff to that individual item. All right. Uh, we can also use iteration inside of a synth def. This is a really cool thing. Uh, let's grab our synth def. And let's make a new file here. No, you can use anything. You can use anything you want. Um, I uh, yes, uh, you do have to watch out for scope. Uh, that's one thing you do have to keep an eye out for. For example, here, if I were to pass in, you know, if I if I do arg i arg synth, that's not a problem, right? This arg i is just, um, you know, it's going to be the numbers zero through nine, the integers zero through nine, and then synth is going to be each of the synths contained in this array. But if I were to do something like this. I think this would cause problems because i is now defined as an argument in the context of this function and will either get an error or it will overwrite this with that. So if you ever have nested iteration, you should always provide unique argument names. Um, but other than that, the name of the function passed in uh, can, be, can be anything. Oh, and one more thing, one more thing about do. Uh, let's let's make some synths again. We're just gonna make them quiet so we can hear ourselves think. There they are. And okay, so if we do synths dot do uh, arg uh, you know synth, we can do a second argument here, which corresponds to the index of the item within the array. It's sometimes really useful to have the index of the item. In the array. Maybe we'll come back to this when we talk about conditional logic. Um, and we're just going to say uh, we'll post an array synth comma index dot post ln. So here we're going to do the following function over our eight synths. And in the post window, we will see eight arrays, each of size two. So each array contains the object itself, the actual synth in the array, and the index. Right? The synth and the index, the synth and the index. So that is, we, we don't just have the option of accessing the item itself, the item in the collection being passed in, but also that item's index. And again, this can be whatever you want. It can be I, so it works just fine. So I think that's, that's what do says. It says the function is passed two arguments, the item and an integer index. All right, so go away. Let's um, make this. We'll call this synthf pure tone two. We're gonna we're gonna sort of start over here, and uh, we'll keep our envelope. And let's say let's make a uh, in in my in my tutorial number six. I make another variable called temp, and temp is something that we recycle in an iterative loop. And uh, uh, and a sig is actually going to be our output signal as it usually is, which we need to initialize to zero or zero exclaim two if it's going to be stereo. I think either one of these is fine. I usually just do zero. Um, and then let's say 10.2. Right inside of a synth depth. This is totally legal. We will pass in the index just in case we want to use it. And we will say temp equals sinosk.ar. Uh, let's forget about this frequency argument. Why not? And we'll say exp rand uh, 200 2000. 
And then we're going to say sig equals sig plus temp. Done. Let's put, put parentheses here as well. All right. So let's, let's think about what's going on here. We have some arguments. We have some variables. Sig is initially 0, so it's just going to output zeros if we try to play it. It's going to be silent. We have an envelope, and then we have a 10.do. Uh, so temp on the first pass is equal to a sine wave with a random frequency. And we take that random frequency sine wave, and we add it to sig, and we store it as sig. So on the first pass, sig is equal to 0 plus temp. So it's the first sine wave. Then we do it again. And uh, sig is a different sine wave with a random frequency. And then we add that to sig. And so we add a second sine wave, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth. And we add 10 altogether. And that is the result of sig. So we apply the envelope, and then we output it. So let's run this. This uh, synthf. Let's get rid of some of our white space, because now that we've seen what's going on here, we can uh, clean up a little bit. Right, so there we go. Synth dot new pure tone two, and we will say amp uh, zero point zero five, just like we did before. All right, so it is mono. I uh, I forgot to make the stereo, so one thing we can just do is exclaim two on the output signal. Okay, so that's working. But you'll notice it's the same random frequencies every time. And that is because when we add a synth def, the code in here gets evaluated once in order to generate the uGen function that lives on the server and that we can then call and activate using synth. And what happens is as the interpreter goes through and parses this code, it gets to X brand and it says, you know, on the first pass, and it says, that's the value. 366. So that gets sort of burned into temp and incorporated into our signal. Then on the second pass, it goes through and says 431. That's the next one. And then these these numbers get hard coded into the into each sine osc and into our sum. So every time we call this, these numbers have already been determined because this is not a eugen, right? X brand is lowercase e. X brand is not a eugen. It's just a simple number generator. So this is always going to be the same. But the way around that is to use a eugen called exp rand capital E capital R. And so now right so getting here the language says okay that's a eugen I'm just going to plug that into the eugen graph function and the server will know what to do rather than lowercase exp rand uh, where uh, the, the interpreter says oh I know what that is give me a random number and there it is and so it's Lowercase e x brand is the equivalent of just plugging in a number that you can't change, right? But uh, capital E, capital R, x brand, that's a unit generator, which doesn't need AR or KR. It actually just, I think it's just dot new. x brand dot new. Yeah. Um, and this is a eugen. So it says to the server, okay, you'll know what to do with this. And every time we call this synth def using a synth, the server says, okay, let's plug these eugens together, and it says, ooh, x brand, give me a new one. So every time we play it, right, a little bit loud there. Uh, it is for some eugens, for only a few eugens. Most of them need AR, KR, or IR, but there are a few which are basically the server version of some language side processes. Like uh, I, the ones that I know of are X brand. Uh, you'd, you'd think it was R rand, but it's not. It's uh, just rand. This is the equivalent of the language side R rand. Ugh, R rand. Right? This is the unit generator equivalent of this one. So there's X brand, X brand, and rand, R rand. These, uh, their method is new. Uh, and also the other one is a mix, sum an array of channels. What I usually do is I just do dot sum at the end of a, an array of channels in order to sum them together, but this is also an option, and I think this one is a new as well. 
but most unit generators run at the audio rate or control rate. It's just that the, the ones that use new don't actually continuously run. They just do something once, you know, like some, some signals together. Um, close your, all your meters and reopen them, I think. If that happens, just like you might have multiple windows open, just close them all and then just uh, reopen and you should see sound again. Yes, they, they are eugens. Um, I think. Yeah, it's we can see Ugen's multi. It's in the Ugen's multi-channel category. So th they are Ugen's. Let's just look at X brand for a second. Uh, I mean that's actually a good question. If they are technically Ugen's. Oh yeah. Okay. This we can see it inherits from Ugen. So yes. Okay. So this is iteration inside of a synth def. It is. It is possible to use iteration inside of a synth def in order to create uh, an iterative process here. So um, in this example, we're, you know, uh, adding just 10 random eugens together. And we can also do this. Check this out. So each time we create a temporary synth def, which is gonna be summed together, instead of just one random value, we're doing a function exclam2. So this produces an array of two unique X brands. And now we can get rid of this. And what will happen here is that the left and right channels will be completely different in terms of how they're generated. So if you've got headphones, this might sound pretty cool. You'll notice we've got different sine waves in the left and the right. And so we have this, these completely different signals. Right. So yeah, that's basically it. Um, that's do and collect uh, outside and inside of synth def. So so do collect. Uh, yeah, did, did I wonder if that's possible? Yeah, because if you well, that might explain it. It's, it's unclear. Um. Why is this not working? Let me copy this, paste this in here. Uh, Sinus freak plus i times 50. So we are at zero, so one times 50, zero amp. That should be working. You're trying to make a harmonic series, am I right? Let's let's see if that works. Yeah, that's, that's another thing. So we're not incorporating this arg i. i doesn't appear anywhere, but we could do it. So I'm gonna do what, uh, what Prajnamind is, is trying to do. And so instead of this random stuff, we're going to do, uh, I think, oh, you, um, freak, hold on a second. You were doing freak plus i times 50. What I would do here is uh, i plus 1. You might need parentheses. What am I doing here? Uh, yeah, yeah, don't rule. Um, so let's do i plus 1 times 100. So let's think about what this is going to do. The first pass, we're going to get i, which is 0 initially, plus 1, so that's 1 times 100. That gives us a frequency of 100. And then the next pass, we get 200, and then 300, and 400, all the way up to 1,000. And these all get summed together. So this should sound like a sort of a piercing nasal. Yeah. So if we change this to 4, you know, and let's make it stereo again. So eight harmonics, 16 harmonics. Right, that's, that is correct. Yeah, we're gonna, I think it would work this way as well. Yeah because there's no operator precedence here. We just do i plus one times 100 in that order. Um, uh, I mean, I guess you can say super glider is difficult about that, but maybe more accurately, it's that it, it behaves in a way that most people might not be anticipating. Um, I, I think it's, you should always just use parentheses just be, so it's clear to the human reading the code exactly what's going on. And somebody who's 
expecting operator precedence might see something weird there. Yeah. Um, now uh, we can also, let's see, let's do temp equals temp times a noise generator. LF noise one running at uh, four hertz, maybe two hertz. Exp range between 0 0.05 and one. So this is going to multiply each of the 16 partials by this meandering linear noise between 0.05 and one. So all these harmonics are gonna sort of ebb and flow and get louder than each other and quieter. Uh, so this should be like a more interesting texture. And we can also multiply the frequency by a noise generator. You know, we don't want to change the frequency too significantly, so we'll just make it range from 0.98 to 0. Point, oh, sorry, 1.01 1. 1. .01 and 0. 0.99. So basically, uh, these values are just going to slightly detune, right? They'll they'll periodically go slightly flat and slightly sharp. So now we have. Let's do 50. Yeah, kind of didgeridoo-like, definitely. I can just do, call this X. And it would be, we can bring back our frequency argument, because right now we just have this sort of fundamental of, of 50. So freak, freak equals 50. And now we can run this x.set freak 60 they uh well there are two processes controlling the amplitude of the sine waves. Well, two, yeah, generally two. So there, there is this env, which is, which is operating on the overall level of the sum signal, the sig, which is the sum of 16 temps. So env is the thing which starts the overall amplitude envelope, ampl the attack, and sustains it and fades it out. So that's sort of a global amplitude envelope. It operates on the whole signal. But each individual sine osc, which makes up this more complex texture, has a noise generator, which is modulating its amplitude. So all the individual six sine waves uh, you know, are, are meandering randomly with their amplitudes, but they are all overall controlled by one envelope. Yeah, in the do loop, uh, we're, we don't even touch the envelope in here. We declare it here, but it is not at all incorporated into this 16.do function. Instead, we just make a sine wave with some randomness in the frequency, and then before we add it to our running total, we multiply it by a noise generator, which has the effect of modulating its amplitude. And then we add them all together. So they each have a unique frequency randomizer and a unique amplitude randomizer. Um, you can imagine if we multiplied these all by lf saw dot kr uh, one dot x range zero point zero one one saw to work. So now they're all being modulated by this sawtooth wave, and we can randomize the frequencies here. Let's say rand. 0.5 to 2. So now they're all going to have different sawtooth amplitude modulators, different frequencies. Okay. Uh, I do want to show the um, syntax for some conditional logic. And primarily, I just want to do if. I mean, I think if you know if, you can look at the... Uh, you can look at the, uh, there's, a, there's a help file called, um, 
Yeah, all right, it is starting to get a little more interesting. It's just you, you just have to sort of uh, understand what's going on in the synthesis function and think about, okay, I can replace this with that, or maybe I can add this extra process, and you know, you, you get into a, a sort of rhythm of it. Okay, so there's a help file called control structures. And this is where we start talking about things like uh, basic control structures. If, uh, while, for, and uh, apparently do is a is a can be considered a control a control structure. Switch and there's also case which I use pretty frequently. But let's just look at if and I really just want to show the uh, syntax. So um, the syntax is if parentheses an expression which should return either true or false. So things like one double equals two that is false. One double equals one. That's true. Um, x equals zero one dot choose. So this is going to randomly pick from the array, and we can say, uh, is this? Uh, actually, we don't need those parentheses. Equal to one. False. So it picked zero. It picked one. Picked one again. Picked one again. Picked zero. So um, that's a. This is a conditional expression. Then we provide a function in curly braces to be evaluated if the expression returns true. And then we provide another function in curly braces to be evaluated if uh, the expression returns false. So a very simple example here. If, parentheses, 0, 1, the array, dot choose is equal to 1, uh, say uh, we picked 1, dot post ln comma, we picked zero. Right? So we picked one. We picked one again. We picked zero. So this is uh, the basic structure of if, right? Here's your if condition, then do this. Else, do that. Right? So that's if. Uh, so let's see, I think I wanted to go back to this example here. Uh, something, let's um, revisit this synthesis. So we have this and uh, let's think of something interesting we can do with conditionals. Uh, uh, thinking, think, I thought I had something here. Um, all right, well, let's, let's, maybe this won't be the most interesting thing in the world, but here we go. We have our, our, our original synth def, pure tone without the two. And let's do a, a little um, a.do. We will pass in the synth and the index. And we will say if uh, index.odd, so this is uh, one.odd, that's true, because one is odd, two is even, three is odd. So this is a, a, a method which returns true or false based on whether the index is an odd number. Uh, comma, uh, synth dot set gate zero. Otherwise, uh, do nothing empty function. We can also omit this entirely. So in this case, you know, we only care about if the index is odd. If it's, uh, if it's even, don't do anything. So let's bring up the node tree here. And we have, uh, it's a little tricky to see, I'll scooch it over. You know, we have eight synths running on the server. And we're going to iterate over, uh, no, it's not A, it's synths. Okay, I almost messed that up. Synths is the collection of uh, synths. And we're going to iterate and pass in the synth and the index, and we're going to say on each pass, if the index is odd, set the gate to zero. If not, do nothing. So this is going to free this one, this one, this one, and this one. It's going to free it by setting its gate to zero, fading out the envelope, and triggering done action two. So let's put these in parentheses. And Oh, and there they go. Now we only have four. All the, uh, every other synth was freed. 
So we can do this again. Uh, except that no, this this won't work. I think it, it won't do anything. Yeah, <laughs> it found them. They're still in the array, right? We haven't removed them from the array. The array still contains eight synths. It's just that four of them have been freed. And so they're gone from the server, but the language doesn't know that. So we can do uh, if index dot even. And we're still going to get some uh, node not found messages here because actually, no, I don't think we are. Yeah. Okay. So it went through and it, it uh, uh, you know, it's it uh, changed them like that. Let's do something else. Let's uh, make a new little bit of code here. And in, we're not going to do conditional logic right now. We'll say synth.set frequency index uh, plus one times 50. So this is going to go through and say the first one, whatever your frequency is, now it is 0 plus 1 times 50. So 50. The next one, 1 plus 1 times 50. So this is going to sort of uh, iron out our random frequencies and turn them into a pure harmonic series. Yeah. And we will do times x brand 0 0.98, 1.02. So we're detuning them slightly. together. Now, so um, yeah, I've I've a uh, I've covered mostly what I wanted to get to today. Um. These are these are three really powerful concepts that uh, I, I think are are some some of the some of the gatekeepers, you know, in Super Collider. If if you can instinctively, you know, realize when is it appropriate to do some conditional branching. Oh yeah, there was something about triggers. I, I'll sure I'll, I'll I'll get to that briefly. I may I may cover it again next week just because it's already nine thirty. Um. Yeah. So. Uh. But uh, yeah, it's, it's conditional logic, if, then, else, iteration, and then also synth and synth def. And, um, these these are, are tools which I am using constantly when I'm working with Super Collider. So uh, let's let's go. Let's grab our uh, pure tone synth def and put it in a new file. So and let's let's make this. Um, Uh, a a non-sustaining envelope. Let's do n dot uh, perk, um, which looks like this. Right, beautiful percussive shape. And um, now normally we don't need to. I I want I want an LF try. I'm so tired of sine waves. Uh, freak phase. Mull. Okay, yeah, that's what we want. Oh, I just, okay, let's do pure try. Okay. All right, some 8 bit video game sounds here. All right, so normally when we have a finite duration envelope, we don't provide a gate or a trigger or anything to sort of say, you know, turn on and wait till I tell you, and now turn off, because it's a finite duration. So we usually just, um, you know, the gate argument here, you can see has a default value of one. So if we don't provide anything, the gate is one, which means as soon as we instantiate the synth, 
the envelope begins because its gate value is one. So let's actually put a gate argument here. And, and this is going to be, we actually already have one here. So gate zero, and this is going to seem familiar here. So x, and we can say x.set gate one. It starts, and if we try to set this again, it's too late. We got to the end and done action two freed the uh, synth dev. So let's delete done action two and just keep end.perk and gate. So now when we get to the end of the envelope, the synth hangs around on the node tree. It's not gone yet, which means, you know, we, we could try to set the gate again. No, that didn't work. So we actually have to set the gate to zero and then back to some positive value. And then we can re-trigger it. And so this is a, a way to, you can just have some process, some synth running with no done action to so that it lives forever. And then you can, you can use the gate argument to sort of trigger it on and off. But it's kind of stupid to have to put a zero back in here and then a one. And so for this reason, there's a special prefix that you can use with your gate argument. It's a T and an underscore. T and an underscore. And this tells the server, this is a special argument. It's a trigger argument. And trigger arguments, normal arguments, when you set a value, you know, the synth is running, you say amp 0.2. It goes to 0.2 and it stays there until it's updated again. If you say freak is 1,000, it changes to 1,000 and stays there. Now, if you tell a T underscore argument, set your value to 1, it says, okay, and it goes to a value of 1. And then one control cycle later, which is about 64 audio samples, it goes back to zero. And then, so it's just, it goes up to one, it goes up to what you set it, and then it goes right back down. And that's a special behavior that happens with arguments when you define them like this. So let's add this. And now we're gonna play this. And now we say T underscore gate. Oops, lowercase t underscore gate. So that works. And now, because internally, this value has just quickly jumped up to one and moment and just instantaneously gone right back down to zero. That's all the envelope needs to say, okay, I'm re-triggering myself. And now we can just do this again. Can you know, change the frequency? So this is, you know, an alternative to, uh, I have two synths on the server. I think I forgot to free one of them. Let's do yeah. Command period, here we go. So there it is, gate is zero, but then we set the gate to one and this trigger gate goes up and back down. If we declared arg t gate equals negative one, for example, would it reset to negative one or to zero? That is a great question. I, my guess is that as soon as you start the synth, it would snap from negative one to zero because that's like it's, I think, I do not know, but I'm pretty sure that T underscore arguments have the, are just sort of magnetically attracted to zero. And you can set them to other values, but those values only persist for one control cycle. So we could try it. I don't think this is gonna cause it to explode. Yeah. So they just, and, and I think we can also set it to, you know, other values. It really doesn't matter. Uh, we can, if we set it to a negative value, that doesn't do anything, or a value of zero, because the way triggers work in Super Collider, a trigger is a signal that goes from non-positive territory to positive territory. And that signal is, re is able to re-trigger something if it goes from positive back to non-positive. So it's gotta cross the zero axis, and that's, the receiving eugen says, oh, that's a trigger, here I go. And then it, uh, it won't listen to that trigger again until that value falls back to zero or below. And T underscore arguments do exactly that. They, you can set them to a value and they automatically snap back to zero. And so they are ready to be re-triggered whenever you are. Um, oh yeah, right, we gotta set this to a value of one. So we can do uh, routine. Um, uh, ten dot do. Um, and we need these parentheses here. 
we don't technically need these parentheses, but I'm just trying to be consistent here. Um, very nice. Let's round it to 200. <laughs> That's the cheesiest thing I ever heard. All right. Um, and one last trick with iteration. If you just want this to run forever, r equals routine, and instead of 10.do, inf dot do infinity so now this will just go forever until we say r dot stop there it's gone and one word of advice when working with routines is that if you ever do a sort of infinite loop if you do a finite loop this is less risky but if you do an infinite loop and forget your wait time, you crash. You crash hard. Um, because you're playing a routine and it says forever, set this synthesis argument and do it again and do it again and never wait. So there's just no break. There's no break uh, and, and the uh, interpreter just loses it. All of a sudden you realize you can't click on stuff, you can't highlight stuff, you can't you know the these buttons don't work and you just have to force quit so it's if you're going to mess around with routines and infinite loops you've got to wait you just got to wait there's just no way around it so um okay i i hope that i've covered uh synth synth def do and collect and if in a in a reasonably comprehensive way uh, I, I remember when I first started learning about do and collect, when I, I took a summer course in Super Collider back in 2010, which really put a lot of pieces together for me. And before that, I really didn't know anything about iteration conceptually. And it was really tough. I remember just figuring out what was going on, what was returning what, what was getting passed into what function. Uh, and eventually it, it made sense. Uh, and it's just, it's conceptually, it, it may take a little while for some people because um, it's it's not the simplest concept in the world. I think if is pretty straightforward, and and synth and synth def. Well, that's just a a more formal way of defining a function of eugens and then playing it. So um, yeah, what I'm going to do next week is it's going to be a eugen fest. We've been doing so much synthesis, just sine waves, triangle waves, sawtooth waves, all these noise and periodic generators and there's so much more out there we will at least talk about filters we'll talk about panners and spatialization and uh there are some really fun unit generators that uh turn the mouse position and uh whether the button mouse button is up or down into a signal that can behave like a unit generator so you can you know use the mouse to control frequency and you can use the mouse button to trigger sounds and that's super fun um and uh, just uh, lots of other stuff that uh, oh and sound files we're going to talk about buffers and sound files on your computer and how you can play those and loop those and the basics of sampling and hopefully we'll get into some granular synthesis as well so that's on the docket for next week but for this week, I just wanted to focus on synth, synth def, if conditional stuff, and um, some basic iterative things. In the uh, in collection, there's do, there's collect, there's also select, which will pick certain items and return a, a select a select few items from a collection based on a, a true a true false statement. So you can say something like um, uh, one to a hundred dot select arg i i dot is prime, and this returns an array of prime numbers. It selects from a collection and returns a new collection uh, whenever this is true. So it gets to one is prime is false, two is prime is true, and so it keeps that one. You know, and there's also reject, which is the opposite, I think. Uh, detect, which returns the first item for where something returns true. So there's all sorts of iterative methods that are useful. But I think that usually you can get away with do and collect for, for most things. And then in control structures, 
there's um yeah as i pointed these out if for while and yeah it, it you know for example for start value end value function so for example for 1 comma 10 uh, arg i i squared dot post ln actually let's let's do um like 3 to 8 so that's pretty easy it's, it's just defaults to uh, integer steps so it does 3 4 5 6 7 8 and gives you the value squared it just evaluates this function for each item so it's a lot like um do and collect kind of there's, there's a lot of overlap between control structures and uh and um iteration okay so that's it i i'm gonna i'm gonna stop lecture there and um i just want to say okay, as always thanks for watching i hope this was instructive at a good pace and uh you know people taking my class will have some, some new problems tomorrow i think i'm going to take it a little bit easier on the in-class problems yeah you're welcome david no problem uh so as always happy to take questions if anyone's been coding along uh sure i will definitely take a look at a paste pin real quick if you want to <laughs> yeah well I, I appreciate you waiting till the end i mean that's i've gotten through my lecture and that's there it's um I'll, I'll give it a give it a go okay So is there something that's not working in here? Is that uh, the reason for the um, the paste bin? Good to get a sense of uh, if you've got a specific question or uh, anything like that. I'll take a look. Oh, yeah, it's right there in a the comment. Uh, Changing GAOF manually after initiating the PDF. Oh, we're getting into patterns now, getting fancy. Okay. Um, right. And this is... Well, just use a, use a pattern here, right? If you put a, a number in here, I think... Um, so, yeah, you want to change this value. Okay, so let's let's just evaluate this here. And this sounds like, ooh, nice. I like it. Okay. Um, so what I've been doing recently is, in, I think PDEF works, but uh, yeah, so let's, so instead of, this isn't gonna do anything. And what is AOF in your, it's the frequency of the modulator. Okay, yeah, so this isn't gonna do anything. But if you, um, if you reevaluate this, like put GAOF here, I think this'll work. Yeah. It's just when you, when you put it down here, uh, it, it, it doesn't update the, the event stream. Uh, you actually need to update your value and then re, Reevaluate the pdef dot play, so it, it plays the pdef, and it replaces the pattern at the symbol test with this new pattern, which has an updated value here. So you need to evaluate the value and the pattern. Um, I've I've been doing uh, a class called pbindef. Um, which what did you call this? I lost it. Test pbindef. So pbindef is kind of like two rolled into one. So let's try this again. So if we play this, and then all we have to do now is just p bind f with the symbol, and then you can just, you know, do this. I mean, I'm not even sh sure you really need a global value here. Um, so let's just set it to 20. Yeah. So I've I've been drawn recently to uh, this this pbind def object because it's like a pbind inside of a pdef, 
but it's less, you know, parentheses to worry about. And when you want to update something, you say, I want this p bind f and just replace this key with this value. So does that answer your question? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, we'll get to patterns. Uh, I, patterns are great. Patterns, it's like the, that's what makes SuperCollider so awesome. I mean, the, the synthesis and eugens and functions, that's all great. But then pbind, it's just this, uh, it's this it, all the pattern, the pattern library is just so sophisticated. It's just this really great language for algorithmic control. Yeah. Yeah, I love questions. Uh, I really, I love, I love talking about SuperCollider and helping people out. Because it's like 99% of the time, it's just sort of like a syntax thing or just like a scope thing or something's not in the right function or it's not getting updated at the right time and it's it takes a little bit little time i think to really to see the problems but anyway What's going on? Not much. Uh, I just finished up lecture and uh, I'm just taking a paste bin code question here about updating a, uh, a pbind, or technically a pbind if. Oh, I went the wrong way. This is what I wanted. That is what's going on. Yeah, uh, take it easy, Pierre. Thanks for thanks for watching. Thanks for stopping by. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, pbindf is one of a family of uh, proxy classes. Um, it's a common theme throughout SuperCollider where you have something, and then you wrap it or in, enclose it in uh, one of these proxy classes. And this basically keeps a reference to the live process and allows you to change it as it's playing. Yeah, so pbindf is, is a version of that for pbind. Um, you know, there's, um, there's a class called task, which is like routine, and there's something called tdef, which is uh, the proxy version of task, so you can update a task as it's playing without having to stop it. And there's, um, you know, synth, and group, the, the version of that is ndef. This is a, basically a way to control a synth, you know, as it's running um, without interrupting it. These are sort of, you know, a lot of people would consider these, I guess, live coding tools. Things which let you um, mess around with sound as it's playing instead of having to sort of set everything up and be very methodical about it. Yeah, thanks uh, for the paste bin, Beetle. Hope I answered your question.
no worries. Uh, okay, uh, I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna get out of here. But uh, so this has been week three, synth def, synth, some conditional logic, and some iteration. And I'll see everybody next week. So um, yeah, thanks everybody. <laughs>